So I'm going to introduce Andrej, uh, is the founding chair of the Anthropology and Social Change Department, incoming editor of the Journal of World Systems Research, and affiliated faculty at the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine in UC Berkeley. Um, one more thing before we start, sorry, uh, does someone need translation to Spanish? To Spanish, alguien necesita traducción al español? Mm. Alguien traducción a español, levante su mano. No, okay, so Albert, you puedes disfrutar la conferencia. Albert was going to help us with translation, but as we don't need it, enjoy the conference. <laughs> and so this, um, I, I give you the, the space, André, and yeah, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for inviting me. I hope we can hear each other well. Um, I'm not entirely sure what kind of the format you are most comfortable with. And I teach in a place, California Institute of Integral Studies, where we are very experimental with ways that we uh, do things. And we do one thing that is usually called collective uh, creation or co-creation of the classroom. So that means, oh, I can see myself looking really, let me hide self view. Uh, so uh, what we do is we try to do this co-creative approach to the classroom. So I'm going to begin by asking you, my proposal is to give a brief presentation or maybe brief introduction to the topic and then to invite all of you to join. So, and to have a facilitated conversation and there are several people here, including Gerardo, who probably already know what I'm about to say, but nevertheless, hopefully they're not gonna to be too bored. So I'm going to try to keep, uh, to just present some of the main arguments or perhaps proposals uh, with some historical overview. And then it would be lovely to have a conversation about it. Now, is this the format or is this the kind of the conversation that everybody is comfortable with? Broadly, there seems to be agreement. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anybody who would like to propose a slightly different way of playing today? Okay. So uh, what I wanted to say today, and I'm really sorry that John Holloway is not here because his notion of fissures, his notion of cracks was so important and inspiring in thinking about education for me uh, that it is hard to imagine really presenting without him, but I will do my best. And we have done this many times at a place called Puebla where John is teaching. Buap, uh, the University of Puebla, where they have created a magnificent experience of collective knowledge production, which is called the Institute for Social Science and Humanities, organized in several clusters. And to me, that place represents one of the most important cracks, fissures. I sometimes use even the term exilic spaces, sound a little bit strange or mouthful, to describe these spaces of play, education, or reinvention of the way that we, as people who work together, learn together and play together, are actually trying to relate to each other in the spirit of conviviality. Uh, my main proposal here is that uh, my feeling is that we should not think about social sciences, natural sciences and humanities. So these three areas of knowledge that have been impressed upon us since at least, I would argue, the French Revolution, and especially after the so-called World Revolution of 1848 in the European-centered, European-dominated board system or capitalist modernity is the term that I like to use, that we should rethink those structures, those organizational structures, that particular separation of knowledge into three spheres, organizational pursuits of knowledge as something that exists in separation is something that we need to break. Uh, 
It's something that we need to reinvent. It's something that, to use the term of the conference, we need to reimagine. And there is a reason for it. The explicit way that the knowledge structures, which I maintain today are completely confused and totally obsolete, have been set up, has been political. It had a political goal, and that goal reflected what we could call centrist liberalism or liberal agenda, or the triumph of liberalism as the main and defining ideology in the capitalist modernity or capitalist world economy. The ones that I'm most familiar with, because I teach anthropology, are social sciences. And social sciences served as a particular link, almost a crucial link, connecting in separation, on one hand, natural sciences, and on the other, humanities. We, uh, we often think about these things as if they existed forever, the same way we think about capitalism, as something that always has always existed, but they're actually quite, quite recent. If we think about the period between 1715 and 1850, we have for social sciences, we have almost 200 different names. Take economics. Anybody would like to guess what was the name that was meant for the discipline of economics, the most popular one? No idea. Well, actually, I'm sort of sorry that I haven't that I haven't decided on that one. It was plutology. So we could have called the economists plutocrats. That was the most popular name for the newly emerging discipline of uh, economics. Others were political economy, crematistic, catalytics. I mean, you know, today unusual, funny names. They finally settled on economics. But all of this happened in the period after 1850. Now, what existed before, hundreds of different names designated this intellectual activities, has been somewhat miraculously between 1850 and uh, maybe 1945, reduced to six names. And in the world of social sciences, these were, as I'm sure you know, anthropology, oriental studies, history, then economics, sociology, and political science. All of them were created in Europe and what we might call pan-European world. So places like United States, Australia, and so forth. Now, uh, this of course signals a certain reduction of the experience, to put it mildly. But basically what happened was that French Revolution has created something that was truly and profoundly momentous in the terms of reinvention of knowledge and relationship to knowledge structures. French Revolution, the most important lesson of the French Revolution, the most important consequence of the French Revolution, of the Great Revolution, as it's sometimes called, is that social change became normal. So there's this idea that social change is something normal and acceptable. Second idea is that social change really rests on this notion of sovereignty, which belongs with something called the people, usually defined as a nation or citizens of the nation. And finally, that the proper forum for actually exploring social change is, or affecting social change, is nation or modern nation state. Proper forum for exploring and also controlling social change were social sciences. The first social science that was created as a social science was the science of history. But before that, I would say that the entire edifice of social sciences were actually the way that they emerged, because again, it did not happen overnight, it happened in this delayed period after 1848, is that uh, it was transformed or it was created perhaps uh, against three really important contexts. The first I already mentioned, French Revolution. The second one is something that is known uh, and it was named actually by C.P. Snow in his famous Cambridge lectures delivered in 1959, 1959, two cultures. Are you familiar with that term? Two cultures basically meant a separation of knowledge that was created in medieval times. Well, if you think about medieval Europe, all the knowledge was theological. 
So the dominant epistemological authority, so to speak, was the church. And you have the theologians who are in charge of knowledge. There is one interesting thing about this, namely the pursuit for the truth and the pursuit for freedom, justice, beauty, were seen as one and uh, unified, unified intellectual pursuit. There was no separation there. Things are going to change with the philosophers to an extent. And this is probably 14th century. And then finally, there is a push where philosophers were sort of pushed out by people who started calling themselves scientists. The term natural science did not exist in those days, but these were what we would call today natural scientists. And they were basically making a, you know, an argument that sounded very clear, which is that um, we need to create two structures of knowledge. One, which is pursuit of scientific truth, which is reliable, which is competent. And that pursuit of truth is something that is done by natural scientists. On the other hand, we have now this separation in which the pursuit for moral laws, justice, beautiful society, and all of that has been relegated to people who call themselves philosophers. Now we have, for the first time in human history, we have this separation of knowledge and creation of two cultures that are going to become defining in terms of uh, how we think about knowledge today. And finally, the third context against which social sciences, natural sciences, and later humanities are going to appear is the creation of modern university. We also take for granted the idea that university always existed. It's not quite true. Medieval universities, and I'm not talking only about Europe, but especially in Europe because of the influence and significance, were a very different affair than, say, modern research university from medieval university. Uh, it wasn't a professionalized institution. With the invention of modern university, again, one of the consequences of French Revolution, we have a completely different structure conducive for the separation in unity, for the separation of knowledge that was conducted by philosophers, by natural scientists, and by emerging group of people calling themselves social science. Social scientists and social science began as a social movement for liberal reform. And that is what I would really like to uh, emphasize because I believe that we often, in the way that we think about knowledge, about this very modern, very recent structures of knowledge, tend to forget that social sciences started outside of the university, but as a reflection of the most important part of the liberal ideology, namely that the world should be governed by people who are competent. And this idea of the community of the competent, this is the term used by Haskell, became very important. And it reflects the central doctrine of liberal ideology. So liberalism as an ideology emerging out of French Revolution basically meant a complete dominance of liberal ideas in the sphere of politics, where the entire politics was organized around the exclusive notion of modern nation state. Then in the uh, realm of citizenship, where the citizenship was reduced to people who belong to a certain nation, excluding ethno-racial others, excluding people who are, we could call working class people and excluding of course women. The third part was the absolute dominance of uh, liberalism in terms of defining property relations, which became private property relations, what today we would call capitalism. And finally, the fourth part were the social sciences. Social sciences emerged uh, around something that was called social science associations. To my knowledge, the first one was Manchester Social, Association, social Science Association that was created to basically do two things that liberalism did very well. First, to ensure that there is competent advice coming to the rulers from people who studied society. And second, that there is something called stadialism. I don't know if this term stadialism makes, uh, is something that you know what it is. I see people shaking their heads. So stages of history, 
that the world, you know, how John Locke said, in the beginning, the whole world was America, right? And then there was this development through stages. This has been recently attacked, and I think in a very beautifully brutal way, demolished by people like David Graeber and David Wengro in their absolutely wonderful monumental book called The Dawn of Everything. And I will really urge you to read that book. This is uh, stadialism as such, was probably Turgot is the, probably the person who used it first, but also Adam Smith. So this became something that liberalism, uh, the most important part of the liberal Eurocentric idea of what the world was supposed to be. And social science theory emerging from all of these different institutions, social science associations, was basically meant to lead to regeneration of social order. So it was extremely successful, social science, as a liberal movement for social reform and for sort of dry facts that the competent people, the community of competent actually was able to do. However, they had to do it, they had to push and realize them through this new structure that was called university. The first structure or the first discipline to become a proper discipline, as I already mentioned, was history. History at the very beginning was something very different than the history that became a social science in the hands of people like Ranke, German historian, who said that we need to write history as it really happened, something that is manifestly impossible. But uh, this was very important for the liberals because liberals had to secure the past in order to create the French, in order to create uh, uh, national identity, you had to create people who believe that there is such thing as a national identity. And that was the task of historians. They were sent to the archives as professional historians in order to create, or I would say manufacture, construct an imagined history of their nation. They were also trying to respond to the challenges coming from the conservatives but also more importantly, or much more importantly, challenges coming from the people whom today we would call the left, the working class, people who were then known by this very interesting term, the dangerous classes. The dangerous classes made their modern debut probably in the Paris Commune of 1871. And the world of the rulers was truly in fear. Historians, were sent to create and to invent national traditions, national symbols, national ideas in order, and this is the argument made by Eric Hobsbawm, one of the greatest historians, in order for the Republic, newly emerging capitalist, modern French Republic to be able to control the working classes. So that was the first thing, how to secure the present, how to secure the past. The second thing was how to secure the present. And this became basically the role of three important liberal inventions. One was called the economics, again, almost plutocracy, but unfortunately not economics, which was supposed to study the market. The other one was political science, which was supposed to study the political state, modern, national, the only proper way of organizing and conducting yourself politically. And the third one was sociology, which was supposed to study society, European society, modern society, normative society. And then we have those people who never made this uh, modern leap, epistemological leap, civilizational leap into what is considered to be a Euro-centered Western modern civilization. And these people who were called savages became subjects of the social science that I teach and dabble in, which is anthropology. And those people who once upon a time did have great empires and once upon a time did wonderful things for humanity, but somehow got stuck, term that Graebro and Wengro like to use, somehow got stuck and frozen in history, like, for example, Persian Empire, like China, like many other empires and cultural, cultural empires, they became subject of a philological discipline known as Orientalism or Oriental Studies. Now, it's interesting that this term is still being, however shyly, still being used, uh, Oriental Studies, and even in, in, some of you probably live in England or are familiar with, uh, uh, with the School of Oriental Studies. 
wonderful people, but terrible name. But in, in any case, it's a very good way, a very good reminder of the way that knowledge was organized and especially through the university. And university was new in the sense that all of a sudden you had disciplines with professional scholars being paid to work there. And these professional scholars defined the disciplines basically as an organization of knowledge, plus particular vocabulary, plus a journal, plus a conference. So if one were to think about what is the most elegant definition of an academic discipline, this is probably it. Journal and a conference, particular vocabulary and organization. And now all of these people were also paid for what they were doing. And modern university became the main locus, not only of production, of reproduction, but also of production of knowledge. And again, knowledge produced through this tripartite idea of social science in between, humanities to the left, natural sciences to the right. And this modern confusion, modern organization of knowledge, way of understanding the world, of seeing the world, of feeling the world, has been uh, something that survived intact until the Second World War. Now, the Second World War brought serious challenges, two from above and one from below. Two challenges from above, though the first challenge from above was the Second World War. There were new priorities. Anthropology and Oriental studies were not exactly sufficient for understanding the new configuration of the world. And unfortunately, we see some of this return of the Cold War thinking right now with the uh, terrible war that's emerging, erupting in Ukraine as, as we speak and as we all have this conference. And I'm sure this war has been mentioned in this conference, but this war is not coming out of nowhere. And the fact that we are not able to completely understand what is happening is also a testament to the kind of impoverished sense of obsolete ways of organizing and developing knowledge that we have inherited. The first blow to the configuration, the old configuration of knowledge came from the Cold War warriors, as they were called, people who are trying to understand the new geopolitics and people who brought us something called area studies. Are you familiar with the term area studies? All of a sudden, you know, people woke up at universities and they had to become Chinese specialists. So you could have a, you know, degree in economics, but you had to learn Chinese and you also had to take some classes in Chinese literature. So these were interdisciplinary ventures and these were places that were, again, explicitly political. You are a Chinese, or let's take a more, more prescient example. You are a Russian studies scholar in order to be able to assist the agencies of the state, in order to be able to better understand that part of the world. That led to the very important loss of legitimacy, or at least loss of stability in terms of anthropology and oriental studies, oriental studies, orient orientalism, orientalistica, as we call it back home in Yugos former Yugoslavia, uh, lost their footing. And this sent them into this very interesting spiral, and I will come back to this of self-reflection. Oriental studies never really recovered from it. Anthropology did. The second challenge to this organiza modern organization of knowledge came from below. And this is the World Revolution of 1968, term that Emmanuel Wallerstein, the late great sociologist or historical social scientist, liked to use. And basically what happened was that there was this fierce, strong, beautiful movement from below that pushed, that was a worldwide movement that did not happen only in France. You know, when we talk about uh, French Revolution, oh, French Revolution, Revolution for, of 1968, we usually think about France. And we usually think about the place where I am speaking from, which is Berkeley. It's ridiculous. Fred, what is so interesting about um, the 1968, it happened in so many different places. I mean, if we really have to push it, we will have to say it started in Prague and in Czech Republic, but it happened all over the world or Czechoslovakia, as it was called back then. It happened simultaneously all over the world, and it really challenged the structures of knowledge from below in an absolutely meaningful and crucial way. So people were saying enough with this, not only with bureaucratic political structures and bureaucratic political ideologies, but also bureaucratic ways of knowing the world. 
And this is where the whole theory of, say, cultural studies or the whole experience, perhaps, of cultural studies emerges. And also very interesting developments in natural sciences. This is where the world of knowledge becomes properly destabilized. But this is also when there is a response from above that came very quickly. And the space that response from above was what we call neoliberalism that started as a response to popular movements from below of 1968. And if after the Second World War, we have this great, absolutely amazing uh, expansion of university system in which the university system became accessible to people and became started spreading all over the world. With neoliberal reforms, we have something very different. We have a very concentrated and very serious effort at defunding, at bureaucratizing, and destroy, destroying or attempt at destroying of university structures and universities. The access to the place where I'm speaking from right now, UC Berkeley, this is University of California is supposed to be a public institution. It's anything but. Today, you have to pay $20,000 to be a four, if you are out of state student, in order to be able to actually uh, be a, become a student. And before that, you actually have to be admitted and it's highly restrictive, extremely competitive. And if you see just across the pond, so to speak at San Francisco State University, these are people who are fighting to survive. Every year, the Department of Engineering and Economics becomes slightly bigger and the, or the School of Economics or whatever, and the uh, departments of humanities and social scientists, or not to mention ethnic studies become slightly smaller. So this was the attack from above that completely paralyzed in many ways, many of us who are now working within university structures. So again, back to the idea of social sciences, as social sciences, as a liberal movement, uh, liberal movements for reorganization of knowledge and creation of certain or particular ideas of uh, organizing knowledge against this fierce self-criticism and reinvention of many disciplines, including my own anthropology, which under has undertaken a serious self-critique that probably peaked in 1980s kind of coincided with neoliberal reforms in, in some sense, but basically went into this place of serious soul searching and attempt to realize and come to terms with its own colonialist, Eurocentered, Eurocentric, imperial past. Now, all of this is bringing us to today and um, to the question that I want to pose to all of you. Uh, if we think about social sciences they're tra and say that they're changing, there's nothing particularly surprising about this. Social science is a way of understanding the world that constructed visions of the changing world. And it's completely normal that they're going to be changing. Natural sciences have been going through similar manifestations, very turbulent, and so were the humanities. But the question is, we are now that we are facing the organization of knowledge, the reorganization of knowledge, that's probably inevitable. I'm convinced it's inevitable. The question becomes, who is going to do this work of reorganization? Are we going to do it? Is it going to happen from below as a social movement for social sciences from below? Or is it going to be again, a social movement for social sciences and other structures of knowledge from above? And I think this is the defining struggle in the world of knowledge. What I would like to propose is that we move to a so and form and forge a social movement of social sciences from below for a new and democratic civilization. This is the term that is being used by Kurdish struggle by Kurdish knowledge structures being, as we speak, reinvented and created in places like Rojava in uh, Northern Syria. And, the, and we can talk about this more when they have uh, disciplines that I think are also presented at this conference like genealogy, science of women, uh, sociology of freedom, 
and many others. So all of a sudden we have many interesting projects of social science and reorganization of knowledge emerging from below. And of course we have this onslaught coming from above. My proposal would be to think about what I like to call world confederalism of knowledge. Social sciences from below, or social movement for social sciences from below, would include creation of a confederation, world confederation even, of research centers, of social movement disciplines, of uh, social movement uh, university centers, like the MST in Brazil that has many, of journals, of independent academic departments, such as the one where I teach, of uh, such as the one that John Hollow and others have created in Puebla, to federate those experiences, to federate those fissures, those cracks, as John Holloway likes to call them, and to create a structure of knowledge that is alternative to the one that was created in this, uh, in, according to the liberal organization of knowledge, around the separation and organization of the world into market, state, and society. So the way to do it, I think, is to find other ways and to go back to the past and see what other people before us have done. We have a beautiful proposal coming from the French, of all people, right? Uh, Fernand Brodel and others, analysts, as they were called, the idea of unitary social science known as interscience. The proposal was brilliant. It came after 1950s. It came to announce the movement for reinvention of history and other social sciences. Came from the periphery of the French university world. Eventually they became in a certain sense dominant in terms of history. But even though they have influenced history, they have not changed the world of social knowledge of uh, social sciences too much. Uh, they presented, however, with this idea of unitary historical social science, a challenge to what we call today interdisciplinarity. And I'm a great enemy of disciplinar interdisciplinarity because I think that interdisciplinarity is another way of recreating division and keeping the division between disciplines. And by doing that, creating disciplines, you know, keeping the status quo disciplines as they are right now. We need to unthink those barriers. We need to blow them up. We need to figure out different ways of reorganizing them, of rearranging them. We need to refuse this liberal centered way of organizing knowledge. And interscience, which I would urge you to look it up as a proposal coming from Fernand Brodel and others was, was very good. They basically said, hey, let's create a different kind of, let's mix it all up. Let's put all social sciences together and let's, create social sciences, let's transform social sciences in this link that would connect the natural sciences and humanities. And by doing that, let's go back to the overcoming of the separation of two cultures, of the separation of the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of truth on one hand and pursuit of freedom, justice and beauty on the other hand. Let's have a reunified sense of knowledge not exactly the one that existed in medieval times in terms of theological knowledge, but in overcoming that separation and overcoming, bringing them together. The second proposal that I'm very intrigued by came from the Kurdish sociologist and freedom fighter and imprisoned leader of the Kurdish movement, Abdullah Hocalan, who wrote two, he wrote many, but two very important books. One is being published right now, in the process of being published called Beyond State, Power and Violence. The other is called Sociology of Freedom. And Sociology of Freedom has this manifesto for a new kind of social science as a link connecting, again, these epistemological adventures uh, of humanities and natural scientists and saying there is absolutely no fundamental difference in the way how we perceive the world as natural scientists, as uh, social scientists as people who work in humanities. Let's bring all of these forms of knowledge together and let's use social sciences as this link, which can actually help us do that. 
And Abdullah Hojalan says in this beautiful way, he says freedom, but the truth is it's exploration of freedom. And what the freedom is, is awareness of life. And his works in many ways inspired revolution in Rojava, which was organized around three particular sectors or three particular ideas. One is women, the other is life, and the last one is freedom. So women, life, freedom. This is the slogan of the revolution in Rojava. Women, life, freedom. Slogan of the French Revolution, state, society, market. Why not organize our knowledge and create new knowledge structures around these ideas emerging from Rojava, around the knowledge of women, knowledge of nature, knowledge of freedom, organized by social scientists, natural scientists, people practicing humanities, studying humanities all over the world in this world federation of knowledge that would unite over the existing cracks and fissures that exist all over the world in many different departments that are misfitting, to use the term that John Holloway likes, misfitting departments, misfitting social movements, misfitting journals, misfitting individual academics who can't really find a home, the places where they're, they're teaching, misfitting teachers, misfitting educators, and different associations like the one that is putting this conference that we are in right now and create again a world confederation of knowledge that would be a social movement for different kind of organizational structures of knowledge created from below and not from above. We live in the time that I think I do not to emphasize how important it is and how urgent it is to actually do something that is very different from what already exists and what exists for way too long. So we need to mount a challenge to the way that we understand the world, to the way that we organize the knowledge, to the way that we produce and reproduce knowledge. University, the traditional modern university, in my deeply held opinion, is on its way out. I do not believe that university is going to be with us the way that the university exists right now for too much longer. We have to be very prepared for what can come next. And we have to create our own structures because nobody else is going to do it for us. And we have to read the proposals of people who are thinking about this against the grain, so to speak, from the moment, from the very inception of the liberal organization of liberal structures of knowledge and social sciences and natural sciences and humanities to see what they were doing, what they were thinking, and to look at what social movements are doing right now. And again, I'm particularly inspired by the one in Rojava, and I keep thinking about what would the world of knowledge be like if we were to organize it around with some method of preliminary methodological agreements in this epistemologically ever ref more refined way around the study of nature, around the study of women, around the study of freedom. And if we were to go to this beautiful formulation that Ojalan offered, the pursuit of the truth as exploration of freedom and pursuit of freedom as exploration of life. So this is my perhaps slightly outrageous, perhaps not, proposal. And I would love to hear what you think and what you have to say about all of this somewhat rushed historical summary of how did we end up here. And uh, I would be really curious to see if you share my unease about the world not about the world, I'm sure you do share that unease about the world in general, but unease about the way that we came to understand the world through natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Let's open the room, right, for discussion. Let's open the room. And I'm so happy to see some of my students here and friends, Luna and Gerardo, who are in the same room. Missed you both. Hope we're going to get to play and do fun things very soon. I'm officially on a sabbatical, which is uh, one of the things that still exists in the universities granted to professors. It's probably also on its way out. 
Cavandi has, do you want to place the picture? Uh, hi everyone, hi Andre, thank you for that. Um, I hope my connection is clear. Um, I'm speaking from Sri Lanka. Um, so I like this question of that you asked about the reorganization of knowledge and who is going to do it. Um, and you kind of gave the, the footprint, footprint of social movements um, and the social movement of social science, sciences from below. Um, and then the, the three themes that you recommended, women, freedom, and life. And um, so the, the, the organization that I have set up on the ground in Sri Lanka, Green Life Generation, actually addresses um, everything that you kind of mentioned here. Um, so I want to kind of uh, take it further and express some of the challenges that I'm facing um, and uh, link it to what you call the community of compute competence. Um, so this community of competence in how education, uh, how, how the current system operates, creates exclusion in itself. And this is the exclusion that we are kind of struggling with with our organization. Um, so uh, when I, um, it's a, it's a, in Sri Lanka, we have this uh, view of meritocracy and technocracy. Again, back to this thing of competence, those who have the PhDs, those who have mm -hmm. the education are the ones who need to be consulted for decision-making. Um, and it excludes, you know, the, the, the bottom, and um, so what I'm trying to do with my organization is kindly kind of, you know, turn this around uh, from the grassroots. Um, and I personally am faced with the same struggle of exclusion. And uh, at least I have the ability to communicate in English to, to still search, to still find a way to break through. But uh, that that is because I I was in academia and I was doing a PhD I I couldn't finish it so I'm not I don't have the two letters in front of my name, which means I'm again excluded. Uh, I cannot get my voice above the a ceiling. Um, so you know, imagine how even below me the, the voices without the, even the, the capability of speaking English, uh, issue of language and not only of like who is going to do it, how we are going to do it as well. Um, then uh, the, the, the thing of this communication of knowledge, it comes to the mm -hmm. forefront where writing and publishing and peer review, this system is still dominant. And you know, like what if, like, especially as if you take women, for instance, I, I was in academia, I have a baby now, which means my baby is my laptop. I cannot write at the speed that I, I could have. So how am I going to get this out? What is, are there any other ways? Um, and, uh, and especially in why this is important is about learning and community development and also resilience. I think that is the most important thing because we need to on in one side, uh, be able to learn from each other uh, and share. And if this, this language barriers, this, uh, the, the way of kind of, peer review and uh, writing and these systems if we don't find different mediums of cutting through these barriers you know how are we going to kind of create the resilience that we need in the future that we are going through um so yeah these are some of the things that came to my mind after listening to you Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, uh, my immediate thought and uh, is we can't do this by ourselves. The greatest problem of capitalist modernity, or one of the many of its greatest problems, is the sense of alienation that it creates. And as much as we try, and these are these are all beautiful attempts. 
but it makes us feel somewhat helpless because we are against a formidable enemy opponent. And the only way to do this is to confederate, is to network, is to create all of these relationships that are substantive and beautiful. And I think this conference is one of the, one of a really beautiful example of people coming together to reimagine that kind of connection. So to connect your experience and your project with projects that many people here in this Zoom room, I'm sure are already involved with, and then to share resources. And by resources, I don't mean in this ugly economic term, I don't mean only money, all the money is of course very useful. I mean knowledge, I mean the way of access, everything that needs and can be democratized and uh, used, I mean, even the language that I'm using right now gives me a slight shiver down my spine, utilize. I mean, even uh, they have imprisoned our language. They made us use the language of bankers and uh, politicians and people waging wars. We use military terms to, to refer to knowledge, to life, to we are using terms of borrowed from banks and corporations. We're thinking about bottom lines and, you know, in our language, I mean, it's just, no, we have this, this kind of systemic refusal that I'm thinking about that would make your experience less uh, isolated or less challenging would necessitate creating something that is organized and uh, working for deadlines, exactly. I mean, deadline, what, what a term. I mean, I don't know if you know where the term deadline comes from. It's the American Civil War. It basically means bent people who are about to be executed. I mean, the whole colonization of everyday life, colonization of language, colonization of knowledge and all of that has to be resisted by all of us, I think, from um, in, in this organized way. And thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm very happy to hear about this thing happening in Sri Lanka. And I'm not surprised. And I think we have Yeya. Who is Muse? Ah, yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I, I, I want, I'm curious about this idea that you throw about the federations of knowledge. You know? I think one of the biggest gifts and at the same time, one of the biggest challenges of the Ecoversity Alliance is to resist, even in the name is Ecoversities, Ecoversity, yeah. instead of university knowledge and ecology of knowledge. Is is hard to resist this uh, temptation of saying this is the truth or this is the way to approach to wisdom or to knowledge. So um, I'm curious about how to see that uh, that construction of a federation in a way that we stop this temptation of hierarchy, hierarchy in in knowledge or what truth is more truth than other. And the other thing I am. Um, I wanted to ask you about is uh, in these terms of exclusion that um, the previous um, participation spoke, what if we start, uh, maybe what we need is to actually put attention in the cracks and what is inside in the cracks, instead of trying to see how we understand it with the terms of science and uh, conventional like mother ways of knowledge and maybe instead of social science we need to invent something different that emerge from the cracks itself and start noticing the points of connections between that wisdom emerging from the cracks thank you what beautiful points i mean absolutely and you know it's it's i with the second point that you made i agree with every single word you said we have to find a way of listening to cracks of understanding, which itself is a different kind of engaged curiosity and a way of listening to something that is bubbling up from below or from in between interstitially. And this is something that we need to learn how to listen better. And I really love that, that proposal, that the, the way that you think about this. And it does clash with the first thing that you mentioned, the first problem of the idea of monopoly on the truth and the right interpretation. 
one can of course go as you know to Abrahamic religions to find where we have that kind or to Plato to find where we have this idea of one particular interpretation being dominant and one epistemological authority being impossible to challenge. But I usually I like to start with capitalist modernity, and this is where the what the previous speaker mentioned by the you know the community of the competent the, of those people who know. These are always the people who have something that is a certain kind of monopoly on the truth. And the French educator whom I admire a great deal, Jacques Rancière, likes to call this the logic of police. And I think he's right. You know, police is basically management of common affairs by competent people. That's the logic of police, which is very different than the logic of politics. So how to move from the logic of police, which dominates our lives really in the way that we think, which is the language of authority. And this is why the anarchists who are probably the least liked and most hated and least understood of all of the anti-modernist or alternative modernist ideas and proposals and traditions in, in at least in Western or so-called European history. Uh, are so reviled because they attack the very notion of authority. The attack against authority, knowledge that belongs to the competent, and in terms of organizing society, in terms of organizing politics, in terms of organizing knowledge, is something that I think is, uh, we have to go and we have to return to that. Uh, the anarchists were interesting because they were talking about uh, very explicitly about the Jacobin way of organizing sciences and societies. And I think that they were right. Jacobins as people in the French Revolution, the section of the French Revolution that has created a particular kind of uh, bureaucratized organization of or way of thinking about social change based on professionalism, based on competence, and based also on this trinity of nation states, language, dominant language, and dominant nation or ethnicity or dominant culture. And that way of thinking that went into much of the modernist revolutionary movements, including unfortunately most of Marxism or the mainstream Marxism at least, is something that I think we need to rethink and we need to kind of get back in touch with all of these ideas that were challenging everywhere in the world. Modernist thinking, and by modernist I mean the liberal modernist thinking at its very root. And that's the root of authority, of competence, of expertise, who is going to lead the revolution, who is going to teach at the college, who is going to advise the president, and so on and so forth. So who has the monopoly? Who is that authority who has, who knows how to resist that temptation that you're speaking about? Um, I always liked the idea of translation. I thought that that was a very good proposal. It came from many different people. Uh, if you think about translating, between different experiences, between different cracks. Let's call it translation, the crack translation. Translation between cracks, the, the thing that you mentioned at the very beginning. If we are engaged, if we are listening carefully to the knowledge bubbling up from these cracks, we also have to think about, or it would be good to think about how to translate that knowledge and how to create these zones of translation uh, in which are spaces of translation, in which something that is produced, created, and even I, I actually I'm very skeptical of the term produced. Again, we are back to the language of economy. We don't produce knowledge, we, we create knowledge, we make knowledge. So if you're thinking about knowledge making, it, the cracks in Sri Lanka, and the way it can be translated into from that particular crack to a different fissure that exists, say, in Berkeley or San Francisco or in the Balkans, well, there has to be a way of certain intellectual humility, but this is not just an individual decision to be humble. It is something that needs to be done by replacing the community of competent by the community of translation, by the community of equals. How do we create community of equals? Incidentally, the idea of community of scholars which was the medieval idea that existed in Europe is a good idea. 
It meant non-professionalization. It meant a horizontal relationship between teachers and professors, I mean, the teachers and students. It meant a sort of convivial way of life that was then later on picked up by many different traditions that we never talk about. I'm sure that eco-versities are talking and federating many of those ways of thinking, say in Mexico around Ivan Illich, the schooling. But uh, for example, free schools that exist in the United States, Paul Goodman comes to mind as one of the many people who were champions of that particular kind of de-schooling. It's something that you never hear about in the United States. And it, this is not an accident. There is, there is an organized silencing of this. So there is a sense of need for recovery of these knowledges, of these experiences. And then I think if we are engaged in that work of recovery, and if we are somehow able to figure out what is the good way to translate those experiences, perhaps we can move from the community of experts to community of equals. And we won't feel the need to impose our truth, meaning our experience or our way of doing things, ecoversal or universal. Ecoversal is not going to become universal. Universal is a unity of particular experiences in translation. And I think this is where we need to go. It's not easy, but I think it's imperative that we do that. Saint Illich always show up in this scene. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, thank you. We have, uh, we are right on time, but there are four people that would like to share something. Uh, maybe let's give like two can, two wants to say something and then Andre and then the other two, if that's okay. Um, yeah, okay. Who was first? I think it was Luna first. Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Uh, okay, shall I go ahead? Um, thanks, thanks. Hello, everyone. And sorry I was late. I came from a, a dance away class and rushed to get here. Thanks, Andre. Andre, um, you, yeah, you, you know, you spoke about uh, the sort of the shift in thinking um, that's emerging out of the Ravuja struggles, um, but you know. That thinking is also expanded in many other struggles. So I've been reading a lot of um, Escobar and Minolo and other and eco-feminist scholars, um, and uh, and so the ideas of uh, reclaiming life and reproduction for the right to life. Um, um, Andrea's here from Ecuador. Uh, the this, um, the summer, uh, the, the struggles, the Beyond Vivier, I can't even <laughs> pronounce the indigenous struggles, uh, the names in, but Escobar calls these sort of ontological struggles. So struggles for another world altogether. So the, these struggles are emerging across the, across the world. And, and there's been lots of academic writings on it, but it doesn't seem to be, um, so I, by default, I'm in sociology, I teach environmental sociology, and I'm doing a PhD that's in anthropology and environmental humanities. But the sort of indigenous ways and knowledges and the ideas of restoration and life affirming ways, it seems to me very much on the periphery, even with progressive uh, scholars. So I just wondered, what are your thoughts? And even in the the emergence of new materialism and post-humanities. So the, the, the analytical and the methodological implications haven't taken off yet. So we, you know, I mean, sociology is so stuck in qualitative and quantitative and, the, you know, it's very difficult to move. So I just want to, to get your thoughts on this kind of slowness while there's a lot of, uh, you know, emergence in the cracks and even a little bit in the sort of mainstream. So yeah, that's my comment, thanks. Thank you, Michelle, thank you. Who was, I think it was Luna. 
Hi, Andre. I wanted just to share, be inspired, being here with you. I joined this collective. It's called the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. And the uh, founder is uh, Vanessa Machado de Oliveira. And she, her colleagues are some of the contributors here uh, at this conference. And that's how I, and with your uh, announcement through our department. And she published this book that was released this year, Hospicing Modernity. And what I was listening to, to you, she talks about, I've been, and she, I'm in a six week workshop series right now with her, with the book reading. And she talks about how, how we have to compost the shit of modernity because it is dying, right? Mm -hmm. And, and how we have to jump it. We're, some of us are in the cracks, living in the shit of the cracks. And some of us have to be willing to go deep into the cracks to one, Reimagine how we respond to crisis, this this educational crisis, ecological crisis, and relearn how to interact with difference, uncertainty, complexity, and failure of modernity, mm. and how to expand our capacity to hold personal and collective space for pain and grief. Mm. And then thirdly, how do we continue to interrupt our satisfaction with modern colonial desires that cause harm. And I think about myself, you know, even though I'm in a post-traditional institution with you, I have somehow, I'm, I'm complicit in a level of satisfaction with the modern colonial desire, right? <laughs> right, yeah, and then the last thing, how do we continue to co-create space for change that isn't driven by desperate hope or fear of desolate hopelessness while the shit is around us as we're in the cracks. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> yeah, we live in the sewage of modernity. Yeah, what to do when we, are, we find ourselves in the sewage of modernity, it also speaks to, to the previous speaker's concerns because I think one of the things in way of how to challenge this and one of the main problems in challenging this and the reason why perhaps uh, people like Arturo Escobar and all of these brilliant efforts uh, that exist everywhere, the ones that Luna is talking about and all of these different gestures towards something else, are uh, not perhaps moving too slowly, right? I think was the term that was used. I think it's because we are still not becoming what we need to become, which is enemies and antagonists of the system. We still try to work through the system as much as it's, there is this Lacanian sense of, uh, that Luna was uh, talking about jouissance, of, of enjoying, right? The kind of this repetitive compulsion of capitalist drive and uh, of drive of modernity. And I think it's, it's very true. There is this desire, right? That we are talking, I would say not a desire, I would say a drive. But nevertheless, we have to figure out a way of challenging that, not through universities as they exist right now, not through the systems and structures and places that uh, the way that they exist right now. We have to do that, sure, but then also create other ways of relating. And this is why ecoversities are so interesting to me as, an, as a project, because it's one of the examples of doing just that. So I think that would be the way of trying not exactly to swim in the sewages of modernity, but at least to try to drain them, right? By creating an alternative system of dealing with it. And by trying finally to move from, you know, from the, to continue with, uh, with uh, the metaphor, from moving from the sewage to actually that is something that is much more uh, well, inspiring and appetizing way of figuring how to make knowledge, share knowledge, give knowledge, and how to think about going back to those fundamental principles of gift and generosity that generations of social scientists have combined to tell us that it's impossible to do that. I refuse to stop believing in ideas of mutual aid, ideas of generosity, ideas of gift. And I think that this is the, if we have any chance at decent chance at survival in terms of knowledge and understanding the world, this is what we have to do.
Thank you. Get out of them. I just wanted to share my joy of uh, being here and listening to Andre and uh, showing a lot of appreciation for him coming here as I am somebody that inhabits both uh, the anthropology and social change department and I've seen uh, the kind of uh, work because Andre didn't speak much uh, about the, 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 the actual work of um, that uh, they're doing, that he's doing, and uh, the rest of the faculty are, are doing. But all of this is being uh, developed at, at, at this small program, in this small uh, institution, uh, but really trying to push for, for expanding uh, imagination and sensibilities and possibilities in, in this academic environment. Um, and uh, and weaving this this mutual aid and weaving these uh, collaborations uh, also uh, across uh, continents and territories from the neighborhoods of uh, Oakland to the Balkans to um, India to you name it and uh, also um, as somebody that inhabits the Ecoversity's constellation and our effort to create precisely this, like a decentralized, non-hierarchical platform of encounter where translations and weavings and bridgings uh, and compostings are, are possible so that um, we recognize the infinite diversity of, of knowledge, of ways of knowing, uh, and also of, of ways of being. And, and the challenges that that uh, poses in terms of researching uh, for another way of inhabiting our, our world and, uh, and the responsibility that it takes to care for, for life and how then these ecoversities or this confederation of, um, of people who are trying to deeply understand uh, and deeply um, enact change can therefore care for, for life um, in this joyous exploration of, of freedom that is learning together. So yeah, just uh, thank you very much. It's been very inspiring and I hope that we can continue playing with all of these uh, ideas and possibilities of um, collaboration in, in the cracks, within the cracks and expanding them, uh, weaving all these different efforts uh, together. Thank you, Gerardo. Thank you so much also for inviting Andre to this conversation. Thank you, Gerardo, for bringing him in. <laughs> and we have a question, last question, and it's, um, we'd like to ask if Andre could expand on his objection to the interdisciplinary. Uh, uh, I was in Chiapas uh, many years ago when I was introduced to a term of undisciplined. And I really liked that term. And somebody said, we need to stop thinking about this from the perspective of disciplines. We have to think about undisciplining the world. And you know, when you say discipline, it works well with what Ranciere calls the police. Again, distribution of certain competencies around an organized authority of the competent. And uh, disciplines in that sense are something that I don't think need to exist, but the a very devious trick that was invented, not entirely, again, intentionally, was to reinforce their existence by creating the interdisciplinary. So the moment you mention interdisciplinary, it means collaboration between disciplines, and there is nothing wrong with that. Of course, we should know more, know more anthropologists, more about economics, well, not necessarily economics, uh, more about <laughs> history <laughs> and more about other things. However, uh, we don't want to have excited collaboration between people who live in different nation states of knowledge. We want to break the logic of nation states of knowledge. And this, this is what disciplines are. So the same way that we talk about internationalism, sometimes meaning the collaboration between nation states, 
a profoundly wrong way of thinking about internationalism, I think. But you could see where the temptation comes from. I think that we need to think about, my late friend David Graeber had this lovely term that he would use, he would always talk about intergalactic instead of international. So I do think that we need some kind of intergalactic way of knowing and not international way of knowing, but even mentioning international does imply the nation. So how can we use, create a language that is going to be intergalactical and not going to be international, that is going to be non-disciplinary and not interdisciplinary. And it's not going to, even if by accident, reinforce those distinctions, those barriers between disciplines, between different ways of expressing knowledge and communicating knowledge. I think uh, we should, language is a powerful thing. I think we should definitely start with language, find different ways of calling that. Planetary is a nice way of doing this. Um, I always like the term planetary, but interplanetary can also be fun. But we also do need to create the infrastructure. We need to create the ways of organizing, connecting in more material way also. And this is what I meant by this World Confederation of trying to bring all of these people, these knowledges, always in plural, together in conversation against disciplines. I was uh, trained by people who believed in what they call historical social science. Uh, they are known as world systems people or people working in the world systems tradition or people working in the world ecology tradition. Uh, there's a hyphen in between. And the idea was always to create historical social sciences or what they called unidisciplinary social sciences, not many discipline, but one discipline. Uh, I actually prefer undisciplined and non-disciplined even more. So interdisciplinary is reinforcing, at least in my mind, this police logic of distribution of obsolete distribution of competences between disciplines. And that's why I would like to go meta, not in a Facebook sense, but in the sense of thinking of language and disciplines and knowledge in a very different way. I just have to say, Hendrik, that you definitely put for me like the illumination in what is key, that is the conversation of knowledges. Like that is the way to avoid hierarchy. Like let's keep listening to each other and, and offering what we can. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're great, really grateful, Andre and everyone that came for this uh, conference and for this specific conversation. Um, I don't know, Andre, if you want to say something else, like to close. Just this. to wish John Holloway a quick recovery. He is, um, for those of you who came late, he is struggling with COVID and hopefully he is uh, going to be okay. Uh, but we'll, let's push him a speedy recovery. And he's one of those people who give me the hope to continue thinking in these terms. 